The best finance functions are integrated with the rest of the business. What a lot of startups forget is that they need to fundraise. So even if you've done your Series A, that money can go very quickly. Don't leave the fundraising to the last minute. Like, if you think you're going to fundraise in March next year, start getting the forecast together, start having those conversations. Really love to have you here. Please tell us more about you and then we'll yeah, well, firstly, thank you very much for having me, uh, Daniel, and the rest of the Purples team. I'm very excited to be on the pod podcast. Um, so I'm Ollie. I work for a company called Rora. Um, we do fin fractional finance teams for startups. Um, and that kind of involves me working with a different startup across each day of the week. Um, before that, I was at PwC and did my finance training there. I uh, got my ACA, um, which was a really good time. Uh, I really enjoyed the training and stuff. Um, but one day I was kind of preparing a set of accounts for this huge list of global company. Um, and the director phoned me up and he was like, why are we doing all this work? Can't we just sign this? No one cares about these accounts because <laughs> it's like a subsidiary of a subsidiary in the UK. Um, and I thought, thought to myself, well, like I was working really hard weekends, evenings, and when you put my actual life into something and someone's like, no one actually cares about what you're doing. <laughs> it was a bit of an eye-opening moment. So I was like, okay, where can I move that I feel like my job's going to be, have more meaning to it? Uh, and looking around, uh, the founder of Rora, he'd been at PwC and started Rora. Um, and he was out there helping startups. And I was like, oh, that's such a great place to go mm -hmm. and make an impact. And, you know, in, in smaller teams of 30 people where I could be in charge of the finance function and support those businesses to grow. I was like, how cool is that? Like, I'm going to get to help these businesses hopefully achieve their dreams. And um, as you probably know, like founders are always very interesting people to work with, very visionary and exciting. So that's kind of me and how I ended up at, at Roar and doing the job I do, which I do really love. That's amazing. That's so great because uh, we always think about, you know, financial control of accountants, uh, maybe in PwC or these big consulting firms, they do the job because maybe they get paid good money, but they probably don't feel that engagement and excitement of saying, I'm helping these startups achieve the dream by how? Helping, making sure the finance, the cash flow, whatever the foundation of the finance operations is really well for them to achieve. So it's really exciting that you are super pumped about this. Yeah, well... Uh... I guess that traditional view is a bit of what I'm trying to fight against. And I think historically, like the best finance functions are integrated with the rest of the business. Like some companies, they just sit in the corner and, you know, you might only talk to them because you need them to pay an invoice or yeah. you're chasing for your pay payroll. Um, and I think now with changes in technology and, and how work is, um, there's a real opportunity to that finance function to hopefully evolve beyond that um, and be more a part of the business. And particularly at startups, um, you know, the bigger you get, obviously you're just dealing with like large volumes of transactions and it takes time to do all of that. Um, whereas at a smaller startup, you're not dealing with that volume. Um, so I think it's up to the finance team to go out and be like, how can I add more value to this business? Obviously the reporting is really important, but can I get involved with the sales team and get to understand what the sales cycle looks like? How can I inform the pricing decisions for your product? Like where can I get involved on the commercial side? And, or how can I help the um, software team like manage their software expenses? And, you know, with all the, like obviously big data now is such a big, exciting word. And then, honestly, if you go look for job descriptions for startups or finance people, so many of them now are like <laughs> Python or whatever. And there's not many of them out there that do that. But what they're trying to do is tap into this broad spectrum where the finance team is a little bit apart, but they have this great overview across the business and they can tap into these different data sources and then analyze it against the finance the finances and be like, well, actually, was this investment a worthwhile decision? How can we drive a bit more profit here? And and it's so important this year, particularly compared to historical years, uh, that profit now is like investors want to see businesses that are focused on making a profit. And that's where the finance team can really come into it. How would you say, or what would you, how would you define financial operations? I remember we were in an event a couple of days ago 
which you should have brought the FinOps uh, award, <laughs> the trophy. But to start from the very, very beginning, what is financial operations? Yeah, um, no, it's, it's a good question. And, and uh, obviously for listeners who don't know, um, you might see like a lot of fractional CFOs out there and, and fractional finance people. Um, and where we approached it very much from was small businesses don't need like everyone loves this word strategy, but like what is strategy for an early business? You're not going out and making acquisitions. You're not like trying to capture a market and, and doing tactical deals. And um, what you're focusing on is growing the business from within. And the best way to do that is basically setting up the processes that work for the business, helping them to scale. So, you know, if you think about it, um, I don't know what systems you have at Payable yet, but um, you know, the, the most, like, how do you set up payroll from day one? How do you make sure that payroll isn't taking loads of time and you don't have errors? Um, and that's the cross between the finance side and the operations. Like, you've got to set up those systems that feed into the finances before you can do any of the strategy stuff. Um, and that's where startups need the most help to begin with. So that's why we kind of led with the FinOps approach uh, and moving away from just saying, oh, I'm a strategic CFO who's not going to do the not underlying. Sure, yeah. yeah, you've got to be so hands on at a startup. I think, you know, the, uh, everyone at the start needs to be almost cross roles um, at Aurora, you know, I've pitched in with it, everything over time. I've done recruitment, uh, did marketing for a while. That was really interesting. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'd go make the tea if I thought that would like win us more money and help out. Like, and I think that is the like the best attitude for people who work at startups. I don't know, you probably have an opinion on that as well. No, no, I hundred percent agree. I think every uh, company has different stages or what operations are applicable in their finance domain, right? When we started the company, and I would love to get your thoughts. When we started the company, right, the first operational problem is, how do we do payroll, right? How do we uh, close the books? How do we track receipts? How do we make sure that we understand where the money is? But the reality of it is one bank account, uh, maybe a few employees at a time, and that's it, right? But then if you are a company that has multiple legal entities, you have uh, bank accounts in different currencies. Then there are these problems when you say, well, zero is not really working. Now I need to have another thing that is keeping track of a system or record, but then you need consolidated reporting. And you have the same problem when you are six months into uh, maybe two years in, but the difference is that the tools and the mm. operational solutions are not the same, which I would love to get your understanding of. Yeah, what is this? Um, and what, what do you do when you have to set the foundation of financial operations, maybe when you are six months in, maybe compared to a couple of years in? Yeah, um, no, this is a really good point. And I think it's like, it touches on a few different things that are so important for startups. Like first off, your resource constraint, like you don't always have cash to bring in. You can't just straight away go to the top level software and you don't always need it. Um, and then the other thing uh, that is really good to touch on here and nearly no business does very well is like, okay, what does my business look like today? What does it look in six months time? What and does it look like in 12 months time? At what stage should I be investing in the tools to pick that up? Um, so yeah, as you're saying on, on day one, like if we just went and started a business tomorrow, like you don't need a full-time finance function for sure. Like go find a good accountant who's just gonna yeah. get do the bookkeeping, send them the invoices. You know, finance is not the star of the show. Building the product is at that stage. You need to build a product that you believe in and can go out and sell. So yeah, don't don't go <laughs> looking around for like expensive finance team. And then if we're talking about a business that's scaling quickly and going very well, let's say you've built your product uh, and six months in, you're starting to ramp up the sales side, that's then you investing in the sales team. And, you know, again, at that point, you might be looking at getting a slightly higher volume and, and want someone who's gonna come in and, and set up more internalized and sophisticated processes. Um, and that's maybe where you start looking at someone a bit more fractional who can come and help you. Um, and at that stage, you know, it's so important to find, and at Royal, like we do this with all our partners, I think often, when people work with similar accountants and stuff, they kind of push on the software tools they know about because that's what they're used to. But every business is genuinely unique and has their own set of challenges. So 
we kind of go and work in house with them and say, well, what do you actually need? Uh, you know, is that uh, expenses cards for everyone? Or, you know, maybe your business doesn't have people doing lots of traveling and that's actually going to be a big cost and you want to keep more control and, you know, only a few people might have an Amex card instead. But you can't just push one solution forward all the time. Um, so, yeah, at that six month stage, um, you might want to internalize payroll a bit. Uh, there's some great tools out there for that. Um, using payment capture tools, so important, uh, saves you so much time dealing with those volumes. Um, and then as you say, let's say at 12 months, you start going and you're like, okay, now I'm thinking about expanding into Europe or yeah, well, expanding into Europe. You're right, is my accounting system gonna be adequate to deal with that? Uh, it's a big problem if you've got subsidiary entities and the intercompany transactions are getting missed. Like there's no way in fact, I'm working with a business at the moment um, and they've been running that all of zero and different accounting systems. Um, and because they can't, because the intercompany transactions haven't been done perfectly historically, it's so hard to actually tell is the business making a profit because the, the transactions aren't matched across entities. So how can they then go and make further business decisions on which countries are profitable and, mm. and which countries do you want to lean into more and, and kind of push the sales cycle there or do you want to withdraw from those countries? And like, unless you set the software up to give you good data, you can't make the business decisions. So there's no point coming and being like, I'm strategic without having all the underlying software yeah. processes in place. Yeah, it's one of the things that we see at Babel, which is how do we, and this is way also one of the things about building the product, which is now we have a system that allows to connect to the accounts. We categorize, so we get the chart of accounts from, let's say, NetSuite, and then you have a bunch of bank feeds data that you need to reconcile there, but it's really hard because blah, blah, blah. So we have the, the, the right level of rules now that you can say, hey, when you find a bank transaction in my Lloyd's account that includes FX commission, this gets sent to my maybe fees and commissions yes, as, as an income. Yeah. There's a maybe here around uh, USD goes into liabilities. So we just do all of these things. But what I find very fascinating is the sooner the, um, the rules of controls are set up, the faster that the team can focus and be strategic. Because if you don't solve the accounting every record in the right way, like in the example you were saying before, any projection, any cash flow projection, direct, whatever, doesn't matter, it's going to be flaw because you don't really know that on the hood data is actually correct. And the other thing is, um, you know, your team, like if you have a finance team, they just end up spending all their time trying to yeah. like correct the data, either historical data or the data coming in and fixing it. And I've seen businesses get in the cycle of like knowing that they need to do financial reporting and having to do lots of manual data checks and everything. But then that finance team can't really focus on yeah, helping the wider business. So you're not getting a lot of value out of your finance team. So I think, yeah, going back to day one, if you can start thinking about, it always comes back to that thinking ahead. Like if you're gonna have different, if you're gonna expand internationally, do you have a system that works with that? Um, and even simple things like making sure your chart of account codes are the same across yeah. different countries, because yeah. otherwise yeah. someone's gotta go and fix that. And if it's like really simple stuff, but if you set up from day one, it just, saves you so much pain it just always amplifies over time and but it's so hard because even if you start playing these two payments where i used to work before checkout.com and uh you think payments are banking or holding money these are the things that people don't know are out there where if you if you know strategically where the product wants to go the under the hood banking strategy matters a lot yeah it's not the same opening a legal entity in france mm -hmm. and store money using the license of storing money for europe in france than in Ireland. Yeah. So the, the outcome you will say, well, is the same. I'm storing money. Yeah, I can do, I don't know, payment services in Europe. Yes, but the operational burden of doing that in France is completely different than if you were doing it in Ireland, right? So when you say here in the finance domain, it's fairly similar. You're saying, well, do you going somewhere else to open a new legal entity? How do you keep the right the operational side of things that people don't know about it, such as having the same you know, account codes because they'll never know this. Um, so it's very interesting as well because one of the things that we observe is normally early stage startups, they start with bookkeeping. 
Then after that, they hire the first finance manager, then potentially financial controller because of scaling. Then they go for a bit, then get finance managers and then the PPO finance. And then there's this blurry world of bigger companies where they say, well, we are a successful company. How do we use money for better things? And then they use that for treasury. Yeah. For the finance controller or the finance team are acting as treasurers in the within. meantime within. Yeah. And then there's a point where they cross the um, size of it where you have treasury teams at, at a legal entity region or finance managers doing certain things such as accounts payable, accounts receivable to make sure the customers are paying on the right time. But it's just so fascinating. That's kind of like the journey of finance, I would say, but I don't know if you agree in the same way. Absolutely. And to us, I think that is a general journey for all startups. And going back to what I was saying earlier about me (laughs) having done marketing recruitment, obviously, if the business is successful over time, that like, you don't actually want those people to continue to do cross roles. and, And, you know, what you're looking for then is someone who comes in and has more specialist knowledge. Um, I don't know, people function is a good example. Like at the start, the founder might do a lot of the recruiting and have a personal like relationship with everyone. But, you know, when the f- business hits 100 people, they don't have the time to be, and it's not good use of their time to be interviewing everyone or dealing with every people query that comes in, someone's upset about their expenses or whatever. Um, so then you're like, okay, fine, we need to bring in a people person who can do all that and is also normally like has a qualification can make sure you stay on the right legal side of anything that comes up um and it's the same for finance functions you know um yeah as an example well i i would still say for most startup you can probably get away with having a smaller finance function for a long time i'd always go back to being like the finance function isn't the star of the show like it comes back to resources. Do you want to invest in generating more sales? Um, And if you bring in a finance function, where are they adding value to the business? Like an FPMA person might be really good at an early stage because actually what a lot of startups forget is that they need to fundraise. So even if you've done your series A, that money can go very quickly. Uh, I've worked with businesses where, yeah, they they almost like getting that first fundraise. They're like, yes, we've we've done it, we're a success now, uh, forgetting that they then need to generate profit or they're going to have to go through another fundraise. So I've had people call me and be like, we're running out of money, like <laughs> we need to do a fundraise in two, three weeks. Um, and then you're entering into that in, with such a, from such a position of weakness, right? Yeah, because right. you're desperate for the money. So you're just going around to everyone saying, I mean, please <laughs> give me money, yeah. So yeah, an FBNA specialist, early on might be able to help with that and, and be like, okay, how do we get out of that cycle? Um, but yeah, it, it, again, it's very personal to each business, but a general trend is as you grow, you will lean into more specialisms. Um, like uh, you might want someone who's an expert in international tax if you're going international because mm-hmm. they're going to mm-hmm. save you money. Um, what interesting stories do you have? Uh, one of them is this crazy one where you say, wow, yeah, they're running out of money in three weeks and into fundraise, which is crazy, right? When you think about it, because somebody should have known, hey, you have a couple of months of, of runway. So, uh, but what other interesting stories can you share? Because I think you and the Roar team have a unique perspective of seeing a lot uh, from early stage, late stage. Any interesting stories so the, the audience can know more what's happening out in the world? Yeah, I think. You know, I've worked at Aurora for three years now uh, and I've had probably five different partners each day of the week for most of that time. Um, and, you know, some have been really successful. Most, <laughs> a surprising number just sort of stagnate and stay where they are. And then some have done very badly. And I'm just trying to think of some of the themes that I've seen across those businesses. Um, I'd say big one, uh, you know, hiring, like it... it Everyone says it, but it it is so important. Like at the early stage, every single hire matters. The first 30 people are going to create that company culture. They're going to be the one who deliver on everything. Like take your time over it, come up with a good recruitment process. Um, Where I've seen it go really wrong is companies hiring like a senior exec team, Um, particularly hiring people who have very good CVs, but maybe not a startup CV, um, you know, like coming from a much bigger company like Facebook or something and, and moving down. 
Um, and when you've been in a bigger company with lots of structure in place and you come to a startup where it's very much like a lot of things are do it yourself, they kind of come into it and have a bit of a shock and they're like, oh my God, there's not someone to like go do my printing or, or <laughs> I mean, that's an extreme example, but yeah. yeah. Uh, or I need to like raise my own invoices to charge customers um, or negotiate my own deals to get you know new laptops or whatever. Um, so they come into it with very different expectations to what the business is um, and they're on very high salaries uh, and you know it's quite hard just to you can't if you bring someone in that senior you can't it's quite hard to get rid of them in a short space of time but they're obviously so important to the direction of the business and like uh, the same i mean we work with a lot of SaaS companies but payroll is always going to be your biggest cost and it's something to keep an eye on um so yeah i've seen a few businesses fall foul of that uh just hiring the wrong people at the wrong time and yeah you know you can, like i work with another company at the moment um and they're maybe up to 100 people still don't have like a fully internalized finance function you can go further than you think <laughs> with outsourced roles um and the added benefit you know is growth is not always smooth uh, yeah. i'm sure you know about this uh, and particularly after covid so you might have one really good year and you go into next year being like right we're going to double again and actually you yeah, know inflation hits and, and yeah. different things like that so that's a real challenge um the fundraising one is yeah <laughs> always very interesting that happens surprisingly often um last minute fundraising i think founders are busy so they like sort of put it off and off uh in particular with fundraising it's such like a like as the business is small so much of it is about the founder and how they negotiate with vcs and stuff um so yeah the the most successful fundraisers i've seen are people who have thought ahead and gone into it and been really selective with the vcs they've picked and you see there's almost like this snowballing effect uh, because the community is quite small, someone will be like, oh, there's other VCs trying to invest in this company. Yeah. Maybe we should invest in them because they don't want to miss out. Um, so you'll reach this like almost critical mass. And I've seen companies then be able to just pick and choose out of like 30 different businesses and find the ones that, you know, align most closely with their values and are going to give them the best advice. Um, though, <laughs> saying with that, uh, the other negative side to that is I think often people view VCs because they have the money. They're like, okay, we need to listen to everything yeah. they say. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, particularly first time founders, they're like, great, I've got someone on board who knows what they're doing. And you know, founders have a lot of stress to deal with. Let's go talk to this person. And I've seen businesses who maybe haven't taken a critical enough eye to the advice they've gotten from the VC, at the end of the day, the founder knows their own company the best and they should be like, okay, does this advice actually work with what I'm trying to do and the mission I'm on or where I think the business is at? Um, so I've seen companies like over hire on the salespeople at maybe the wrong stage when the product still needed building out, um, but you know, VC is pushing them to get profit. Yeah, I know that's one of the things that we I see with my partner friends where they they raise and then they're like, hey, go and hire a massive team, but you don't have justification. But in their uh, you know, investors, I think what they're really good at is two things. One is pattern recognition, mm -hmm. but sometimes that could be flawed because every company is unique. And then allocating money, right? I think that's what it is. So there's their operators and they won't understand now you have to go. But the founder needs to have this pull from the market or conviction or something that says that makes sense but this doesn't make sense because of xyz and then they go and you know they fundraise or hire or let people go whatever that is but it's always very 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 challenging for the founder to really understand is this is accurate or good decision making or advice versus this is more of a they're so high level they don't understand what's happening under the hood to really give, really give a good advice. Yeah, and I think that's a good description. It is high level because you have to remember across their portfolio, you know, they have tens of companies to look after and they're checking a bit of reporting and a bit of information and having the occasional conversation. But at the end of the day, the founder is the one who will know if they've actually hit product market fit or where the business is at in their life cycle. Um, I'm definitely not saying discount VC advice. I think it's more just saying, 
take the advice but yeah think about it does it fit with where you're at how you think everything is going um and I, the thing to add to that now is uh what's so amazing now is not just the software tools and finance but i think the other amazing thing is the amount of communities and how easy it is to contact other people it sounds yeah, like you yeah. really speak to lots of other founders yeah. but lean into those networks and you'll find someone who probably has been through a similar situation, either made the same mistakes or found a path through. And, you know, again, go out there, see what other people say, take that information and, and come to your own conclusion. But there's so many Slack groups for yeah. founders, communities. Yeah. We've got ones for finance people, operations people. Um, and, you know, I think when I was saying about my excitement of working in startups, most people choose to do it and they're excited yes. about it and they're very friendly and looking to support each other. So. Yeah, it's like an ecosystem that everybody wants to improve and if we make the ecosystem better, then better products have been built and then better for everybody. So, okay, so let's say we already define the foundation, right? We already define what it means to have the first finance hire, to set up the right processes. After that, potential will be like cash flow and starting to think about being a bit more strategic. What's your advice? How do you think about it? And when you are a company, how do you do proper cash flow? What is like a good advice or good practices that you can recommend to the world? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I think first off is, uh, well, as we were discussed, making sure that the data that you are getting into your accounting system is accurate. Like I can't understate that. You can't make any forecasts or business decisions if you're missing out 50,000 of expense in one <laughs> month or your sales are overly optimistic. Um, so yeah, going back to that, that point, uh, make sure that's done. And then step two is, okay, take that information and build, build a forecast. Like um, the mistake I see so many people make um, with forecasts particularly is, uh, I think I believe, you know, it needs to be complicated. It's really impressive if you use a, a massive Excel formula that has loads of ifs in and, and different things. That's completely the wrong way to approach a forecast. Keep it simple and make sure that anyone who looks at it can understand it. The best forecasts you can build and change in a short amount of time. Um, you know, In my experience, nearly every startup I work with, you'll, you'll spend, uh, you can spend like a month building a forecast uh, and then start using it and then realize the pivot that the business has pivoted to a different <laughs> position yeah. or you know uh set like your biggest customer might have left for whatever reason or you might have just won a new customer and you know there's no point then sticking with that forecast you built a month ago be flexible like have something that you can update regularly but easily um that way you can consistently inform your business decisions like the best thing about small businesses is you can be agile um so that's that's another really important point and then i'd say the other thing like the biggest thing i think everyone approaches it from the side of revenue uh as a fan i'm sure you you enjoy this as well but founders love looking at the revenue forecast because it always looks great right everyone's optimistic about how much more more customers you're going to bring in next year but that's not Obviously, you just have less control over that part, whereas expenses, you actually can control every single element of that, right? You choose who to hire, you choose which software subscriptions you pay for. Um, so many startups, again, that we start working with, you'll go in and look at look at the <laughs> software subscriptions for one. Uh, they're always a great example, and, and um, Startups like to be very friendly and give out expense cards and things, but you realize that like that meant that mm. all the data engineers have signed up to <laughs> their version, their favorite version of whatever particular software yes. it is they want to use. Uh, and actually you can probably save a bit of cost by just being like, okay, let's just use awesome. one software. Um, or at least talk to them about it and be like, okay, do you have a business case for this? Um, and building in that rigor of being like, okay, can we have a conversation about what cost do we actually need? Um, That's so fascinating because maybe because we are a pre seed company, we don't really do that. We are, I would say, are very cost efficient. Like we don't really, salary is the biggest cost we have. But I think since the very beginning, we, funny enough, so Sol is a um, uh, software engineer, one of the founding engineers here, we, before us at Curve. 
And after being here for a month, uh, payroll, he, he said to me, dude, we use our money in a very good way. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, yeah, we're not really going to fancy dinners, fancy parties, fancy software. We just use the minimum. I think even for engineering, people don't care that much about the tennis thing you can have in, a, in, a, in an office. They care about building uh, something good mm -hmm. for great users solving interesting problems. So if you're doing that, people are generally excited. Don't get me wrong, sometimes of course they want to use their fancy new tool so they can be excited about this new data, Snowflake, whatever that could be. But so fascinating that story because we, we don't really we don't really do that. We are, we, and we don't really test out um, a lot. I think we just test out things on product and that's something we we're trying to build outside. But um, the team in general, we don't make a lot of bets on new technologies just because we're bored. I think maybe because we're so so focused on getting product market fit, new customers. Maybe when you're more Series A, Series B, yeah. then you have more time to be so, trying new things. Because I guess I'd fit that back. How, how many people are in the team at the moment? So we're 15. 15. So we're 15. So yeah, because I still think there's a really nice sweet spot between very early and 30 people. And I don't know how often they come into the office, right? But everyone could come to every meeting and have a contribution and you get to share information very easily and uh also like those people are all very much invest in the business right they've joined a startup because they believe in the product and growing it at a certain point you reach a size where you are a business for some of the people coming in yeah. they're not as invested in yeah, the yeah. company uh and also like when we we're chatting about specialization earlier in the finance function over time like you kind of described the life cycle of moving to different teams and you get that segregation and communication drops off of it and that's where you start to see oh actually maybe a different team isn't talking to another team and they're both using the same software or they want to bring in their own software and um going back to senior hires as well like they're often really experienced people but they like a lot of them will have a way of doing things that they've yeah. built up over the years um yeah i think from that point of view when you go to a certain point, your attitude kind of continues. And let's say you get to 100 people and then one day, it, like I'd come in and look at your finances and be like, oh, wait a minute, you could probably save like a few thousand a month here. Uh, and that does compound over time, like 100%. it makes a difference. And now like this year is so different to coming out of COVID, uh, investing, VCs had so much money to invest. Um, and then this year, like when you're ha like having conversations with them now, it's a completely different field. Like everyone is like, we want to see someone who's really in control of their finances. Like we want to see that you're moving towards making a profit. Um, and I think almost startups forgot how to do that yeah. a couple of years previously. Yeah, it was a different game, right? So I think yeah. a lot of the product people, because of what I can speak, they were, um, they had a duty of growth, you know, acquiring customers, mm. doesn't matter how. And then now is um, fascinating. I saw a tweet from the Tom Blomfield, the monster guy, saying, hey, it would be great if someone can just go ahead and build a revenue cost generating platform for every user. So when you are a card company, you make a swipe, let's say as a monster user, you make a swipe. How do you know the unit economics by, uh, this person make a transaction in the US, so there's a conversion interchange fee, so it's just been split out in every cost by that user. Yeah. So they use that to then aggregate and understand the cost basis by different places. And it's so fascinating as well because we, we brought Drew, he's a CFO in a company called Nansen. He was an early hire in um, Wise at the time, Transport Wise, and yeah. he was there all the way up to IPO. And that was one of the things he, he, he was focused on, which is how do you pricing in a way that the finance team is working with a product team so you understand exactly when you board a customer, you suddenly know, okay, when I board this Mexican guy in the UK as a payments wise transfer company, it costs me more because uh, KYC, know your customer, mm. is maybe higher from me to whatever, right? And then what happens if marketing did an ad on Daniel and then the KYC went through that? And it was very similar to the monster tree that I saw uh, but is this example we we're talking before, where before was the product manager was just thinking about growth, and now is more the product person is thinking about okay, CAC to LTV to unit economics at a very low level detail level, so then on the other side, the finance team understands how to do the modeling. And I, I think that also touched 
nice other, another point I was making earlier of how the finance team can add value across across the business. Um, one of the things <laughs> I used to, maybe it's because my partners have less money, but um, I used to get invited to all the Christmas parties and, and be more part of their teams. Uh, I feel like this year I'm not going to any Christmas <laughs> parties, which is a shame. Um, but your point there, I think you said like the product team, the marketing team and the finance team, you all mentioned the same sentence and you know how you can look at those costs. Uh, and I really do think the finance team can bridge that gap and also, you know, I'm not expecting them to do all the data analysis, but they can get the data analysis from the different teams to bring it together and be like, okay, how can we look at the unit costs? Um, and yeah, as part of that, the finance team should be friendly. They should be there in the office and meeting people and, you know, some stuff you only learn about by being in the room and, and keeping contact with people. And it's always interesting as the company grows, uh, I think in other, particularly in software and stuff, you've seen much more of these like cross-functional roles. Um, I don't think we've quite achieved that in finance and big companies. Uh, I guess the closest thing is finance business partners, which you see at bigger companies. But I think there's still a gap there where maybe FinOps can bridge that gap a bit more, but they, they are cross-functional and across different areas. And the business is only going to win off the back of that if someone's able to bring all that expertise across. When, when do you think it's, and I know everything is so different because our company is different, but what's your advice on when to bring a CFO? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think I started off saying most companies kind of try and bring one in too early. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have a friend who's a founder of a company saying, please see that they brought a CFO and I asked him why. He's like, well, we want to increase revenue, reduce costs. And I was like, well, that's interesting, yeah. Part of it is, and it's interesting, when you see job descriptions, right? Uh, I think the, for startups, almost the job title doesn't matter. It's like, what are you actually going to be doing? Um, it's for early stage business. It, it doesn't matter what the title is. If you bring in a finance person, um, are they going to be hands-on? Like, are they going to set up the processes and software? And then I think the best ones, again, it, it depends a little bit on what the founding team are like. Um, yeah, as an example, I, I work with one company and, you know, the founding team, one's really the CTO, very technical, another one's very focused on sales, but they, they're they not necessarily interested in like checking on the financial data and that side of it. So they probably need someone who's going to just do the, the finance and operations. But, you know, you might have, uh, I've seen other finance teams, uh, sorry, other founding teams where, they're really technically strong, but on the commercial side, like they love coding, they love like building a product, they're amazing in it. Um, but at the end of the day, they need to go out and sell that product. So, you know, for, for a job role for that company, you'd be saying, okay, we need someone who does a bit of finance, but are they really commercially strong? Like, are they like, do they have the unit economics? Ideally, would they be able to go into a sales pitch and sell the business? Um, so, yeah, at that early stage, it's almost like the job title doesn't matter. Um, but there is a point when I think you do need need a CFO. Um, I think where they can really come into their own is uh, when you're going for the later investment rounds, Series C and beyond. Um, you know, they they can give you a lot of credibility. Uh, VCs and private equity, they look around and they sometimes want to know that someone's there to kind of put the brakes on a little bit and has that like strength of character to be able to say to the founder, Oh, I know you've got this great new idea and you want to invest like a hundred K, but um have we like priced up this investment? What's the forecast going? What's the return on this investment? Like how are we gonna get there? Um and they I've seen them those kind of CFOs act as a bit of a conduit to raise more investment because the VC is sort of like, Well, I don't feel like you spent the money previously very well. I'm not keen to invest again and they're like, Well, we can put Right. some controls in to make sure that we're spending the money on the stuff that you think we should be spending on. Um, and yeah, they, they just often a very good face for investors because they're just like, oh, it's a safe pair of hands for the money, whether that's right or wrong. Uh, I don't know, but it, it, yeah, it's, it's probably a shame that that is the best way to add credibility because it's sort of like just, optics. yes, exactly. That's a great word for it. Optics. Um, and I, I don't, to be honest, I think that optics thing, uh, the startup world suffers from it probably quite a lot. I think there's always crazy stats about how many women raise investment. It's like yeah. less than 3%. And I think people, there's a certain expectation, expectation, there's certain roles have a certain person 
who looks like they should be doing that role and for people investing that can add a bit of security to it. Yeah, no, I, I completely get it. I remember I was watching Succession, a uh, great show for everybody that haven't watched it. And Ken Randall, I think Ken was going to, Ken Roy was going to present these new, from shareholders, a new vision. And the CFO said to, to him, hey, I'm not signing up on this. So be very careful what you say, because I am not on board on this. Because on one side, I think at the later, later stage, you have the founder was always visionary, you know, the new product, the new thing, the new way for us to increase revenue. But the other side of it is that CFO being more thoughtful, that maybe he's a backer to say strategically, financially, this makes sense. Because the founder will be always an optimistic person to say this will be the next step, right? So it's an interesting thing that you, that you see this way because, yeah. Yeah, I think the other really important thing is where CFAs can also really help is like the regulatory stuff. Mm -hmm. If you are doing really well and you know you might want to go list one day, you're not going to find like you're only going to be able to get someone's very senior to help you navigate that path because you want them to have gone through that before. Yeah. Um, and there, like as a CFO, yeah, you're not going to be able to find someone just anywhere who can deliver that. It's going to be someone who's probably gone through that journey and worked as a CFO and taken a company to listing and knows all the regulatory hurdles, the compliance stuff, all the, basically all the boring things. Yeah. They're not boring, but very important stuff uh, to deliver on. Um, and yeah, I guess that comes back a bit around to the credibility and, and point. And okay, that's amazing. What is the best advice you receive in your career? You've been with a lot of uh, startups, you've been working with, you know, with Rora before KPMG, so you have a, a, a horizontal set of experience, but a very vertical um, skills, I would say, you know, from a finance perspective, right? So what advice have you received? And I wonder also when you were making that jump between KPMG to going into Rora, I bet, you're like, oh, should I do this? Should I not do this? Or there's a pull on the gut to say, hey, you know what? I, I, I want to get this passion and happens that you're getting now and working with startups. But yeah, what's the best uh, piece of advice you received? Uh, well, I've got a slightly funny one. Um, one was uh, someone once said to me, don't trust anyone who's been in the same role for too long. Mm. Um, I mean, that, that came from, you know, I think anyone who's very in, uh, capable and... Uh, Yes, I don't know how well capable and wants to challenge himself is never going to get comfortable. Like if someone sat in the same role for I mean, the time scale is probably short now, but let's say ten years, then it means they're not willing to challenge themselves anymore. They've got very comfortable, uh, and it's kind of a question: Are they going to bring like the new lens to the business? Are they going to like deliver the big growth? Um, and that also is filtered to my personal, I guess, career decisions. Um, you know, working at Rora as you said, is fantastic because it gives me this wide range of variety in lots of different areas. Um, being able to challenge myself every day, like, is interesting. Sometimes it makes me want to pull my hair out because it, it's a challenge, but that's kind of how you grow as a person. And, uh, you, you know, I, I like, um, like last year I did a three kilometer swim. I'm doing a marathon nice. next year no and way. stuff like that. But for me, life is like, picking out a new challenge that you can work towards each time and then build up on that. And I feel like that's the kind of thing I want to take into my working life. And, um, you know, will I want to work in finance forever? Maybe not. Maybe I want to go and work in operations and try out different things as well. Um, Hopefully the person that gave you the advice was in 10 years in KPMG saying to you. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, no, funny enough. No, they reached partner at a really young age and then they jumped around and did a lot of interesting things um but yeah no they didn't stay, they didn't stay in the same <laughs> place i know, so no, it's like true. don't trust buddy and then <laughs> as i said the person has been 12 years at kpmg <laughs> mm -hmm. that's so fascinating because i think for me as a founder uh what i love being a founder is just a set of problems so i love solving problems it's just what i really love it's funny because sometimes my my partner will say to me a thing and i'm just problem solving and, they, and I have to be like, hey, do you want me to listen? Do you want me to problem solve? Because I just enjoy solving problems. And when you're a founder, I think it's like a video game. You're trying to solve first problem, which is the first hire, then you know the first bill, the first sale, then the first ability for you to scale. But I also try to do the same as you on the outside world. I love climbing. And I climbed 22 meters like two weeks ago. And nice. I was such a challenge. Yeah. 
But how do you bring that, right? Like that ability for you to solve problems or new challenges into your work. And I do admire the people like you that they say, maybe one day you're like, hey, finance is great, but now I want to do operations because maybe that's the next big challenge. It's amazing. Like I, I was a lawyer and from lawyer I became a product manager and I know that the buffet is always risky, but there's this excitement of thrilling of trying to understand something new and then trying to master it, I guess. Yeah, and that, that, pro that problem solving, that's the thing that comes up with a lot of founders I talk to and you know, most of them are very good at it, but it's like, how do you almost reduce a problem to its simplest form and then deal with it? And I think, you know, I wouldn't say I'm amazing at it, but it sounds like you're very good. Um, most founders are, but it's then, if you can do that each time, you can tackle new things consistently and come up with a solution. And that's such a good way to approach work and, you know, keep, keep growing as a person. Um, but yeah, fa founders also particularly, lots of ones I work with, um, there's one I can think of, um, and some of them are just amazingly quick at getting a grasp of something brand new. And I think they're yeah. quite happy putting themselves in comfortable situations. But um, yeah, this guy, I think yeah, he's got a software coding background, um, but he like, yeah, I feel like it took five minutes talking to him about finance stuff and he, he just got it. Like, I don't think I'd ever spoken to someone who just gets it that quickly. Um, and so you, you can see, like, you can just introduce new things to him and he'll, like, really understand the essence of it. Obviously, <laughs> that's not always the case. And sometimes it can be a bit frustrating when you're <laughs> working with a founder and you, you're explaining something from a finance background and it's not always thinking um oh, that makes sense. yeah well i think one of the main challenge ones is um uh forecasting actually <laughs> uh because everyone like if i was like oh build a forecast for your own at home spaces right you'd get a spreadsheet and be like okay this is my money coming in this month this is money going out um but for good f forecasting right and um, it's all driven by like, the balance sheet and the PL, and then you calculate the cash flow off the back of it and um, you need to have a bit of an understanding of like the accounting relationship between the different parts and how receivables days work those kind of things and um, but it, it kind of turns into more of a shortcut where you don't have to like go line by line but it can put in like simple assumptions and it, it, it brings together like an accurate forecast. But. What are your thoughts on FBNA tools? It's, it's funny because I was chatting with an investor today and they invest in one very well known and and then um, yeah like she gave a good, a good perspective of that right and then I was talking to the people of finance in another company and he even said to me well you know I love this tool because it's like great like it's, it gives in my perspective it gives a bit of a um, vanity effect halo effect you know that effect when someone is really good at public speaking that you just believe whatever they're saying uh, just because they're good aesthetically of maybe articulating something and I was wondering that uh, today where if someone is always on spreadsheets building models and then just tables and then they suddenly have a tool that is like beautiful and just projecting something but under the hood is not really taking the balance in the PNL and the and whatever models you know that you're using in my head I'm thinking well would that be a massive FPNA as a world a big thing or not a big thing but what are your thoughts on the FPNA tools forecasting tools yeah what are your thoughts in, in that space yeah um all the investors probably listening to this <laughs> well for, forecasting is really interesting because it's at the end of the day, particularly for a startup, right, um, you don't have many year sort of historical numbers to actually draw on. So, and you can make that revenue line look like <laughs> anything uh, as long as it looks believable. Um, but yeah, yeah it, you will see a lot of hockey sticks. Um, but that, that actual diligent forecasting, there are some really great software tools out there. Um, and I think that's one of the really exciting things about um, where we are today is kind of, uh, we name check one of my favorites, which is Causal. Um, they plug in to like, they, they've got their API to just plug into lots of different areas so you can connect up to your HR system and it just pulls in everyone's salaries and it will keep that up to date so you could do it mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. acting in real time. Um, you know, they can plug it into your data warehouse, extract whatever data you want to get from there. Um, so yeah, historically Excel's 
don't get me wrong, it sells great, right? It's so flexible. I can do a lot of stuff in there. Um, but now these software tools, the best ones, I think, are evolving beyond that and saying, okay, what are the other data sources we can tap into to create better forecasting, more up-to-date information? Um, and going back to what I was saying earlier about not spending too long forecasting because startups are going to pivot in three months' time yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's pulling in the actual data and, and forecasting off the back of that, then it yeah, saves yeah. you so much time, right? It, like, I don't need to go in and edit the sales and double check the, the formula. The other thing that a lot of startups kind of get wrong as well is they share the forecast sheet without with 20 people, say, and always someone goes in and start, starts adding lines and changing it and, and the numbers get wrong. Um, so yeah, these software tools now, the best ones are really good and they should plug into your accounting system, they should plug into your HR system, they should plug into your data warehouse. They have a dashboard that on the front will give you really beautiful reporting, uh, which you can share to investors. Um, though I've seen a lot of investors who um, I've shared uh, calls with dashboard with one before and they were like, what is this? I don't understand it. Please send us an Excel spreadsheet, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is so, I think, so sad, um, but, you know, for a company that's investing in technology <laughs> startups, then just be like, guys, we we don't want to embrace this new technology. We just want a, want a spreadsheet with the numbers we can check. I um, know an investor that invested in a very big, well-known expense management company, but the investor, the partner, when buy something, has to bring the receipt and scan it and send it over to, like, when I'm scan it, not like text scan it. I'm saying literally taking a copy and then like literally a page where receipt one, two, three, four, like it's been copied and then bring it into the finance team. It's this insane pot. They made a lot of money on this expense management company that is growing a lot. They raise a lot of money, but on the other side... They just want you to... <laughs> yeah. uh, the last question is, well, look, the end is, um, the year's almost ending. It's almost 2024. What are your plans? What are your plans? What is uh, getting you excited for the next new year? Yeah, um, well, I'll probably give a brief recap of 2023. I think 2023 has been an interesting year. Um, you know, there's been a lot less VC investment, uh, a lot more focus on profit. Um, and I think everyone within the industry it feels like everyone's sort of waiting to see how it pans out and there's not maybe been the growth that we've seen in previous years. I do think these kind of things do go in cycles and... Um, very optimistic that next year uh, we'll probably see maybe not the extreme growth of post-COVID, um, but starting to see VCs kind of looking to invest in new areas. Um, I know that some areas are very strong at the moment. Uh, AI, obviously, and sustainability, they have been seeing investment. Um, so we'll see if that continues into next year. Um, but yeah, it's <laughs> still, I can't, yeah, it's so hard to forecast the future because at the moment, I think everyone's still sure. Still, yeah, yeah, I know. I don't know how you are finding it at the moment. Yeah, yeah. no, for sure. It's, um, I think last year, mid to last year was extremely hard for every founder that mm. I know, everything. Then this year has picked up, but not when, when I say picked up, I'm saying where there was nothing last year. Yeah. So there's been some good investments. But like you mentioned before, good companies curated by the founder building the relationship with the investor. Not um, out of the case, something like massive happened, no. Next year, things have to change just because uh, I know well, I was talking to a founder friend, uh, there's these couple of funds where they just close new funds. Yeah, and then, the, the, yeah, yeah, and they'll do it in the last couple of months. So they need to, of course, um, start investing get the, the one moving. But on the other side, yeah, interest rates are 5%, right? So if you're an LP, why would you give money to a uh, VC with the risk of maybe one out of the 10, 20 will work? Yes, maybe you have a mass multiple, but it's 10 years, maybe just put your money into a uh, market fund or just bank and get 5% there. So there's been these kind of like interesting things. As soon as these interest goes low, plus market dynamics on the funds, now they raise so much money, things will change for next year. Yeah, and I, I think that's where it's so important to almost be focusing on the fundamentals. Like, have you set up the process and operations? Are you focusing on trying to get, I mean, you don't have to make a profit, but if you show you're being diligent and moving towards that, 
And then going back to what I was saying earlier, it's like, don't leave the fundraising to the last minute. Like, if you think you're going to fundraise in March next year, start getting the forecast together, start having those conversations. Like, you're going to be in a much stronger position to negotiate with VCs than if you're running around trying to get yeah, the money and you're stressed. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they see a lot of pitch decks and, you know, someone who comes into it confident and prepared is always going to get an advantage. Um, and yeah, and, and in light of that, I guess, Roar itself, um, you know, same as the rest of the market. So we've kind of diversifying our offering. Um, we kind of, you know, we started off on a mission to kind of make finance jobs more exciting and working with startups and we're moving beyond that now to other areas. So uh, at the moment we've launched uh, basically equipment for people ops. Um, we've got a great people ops, uh, head of people ops now called Jag and he's going into businesses and helping them set up or run their people ops function. Uh, another area that's very good for startups to outsource early on to someone who's got a lot of expertise and again has that range of experience. Um, and then the other area that we're just tackling at the moment is uh, legal ops as well. Again, one of those things that is a real challenge for early stage businesses. Um, I think a good example maybe is Roar itself, like the first, the very first like staff contracts you hand out. I'm sure you might have done this, like you go online on the internet, you find <laughs> the staff contracts and it has all these yeah. conditions. First of, customer in your contract. Yeah. And, you know, they might have clauses in there that action meaningless for your business or whatever. Um, but do you have the time to go and go and change that? Uh, lawyers are really, really expensive. Like no one wants to pay for a lawyer unless they have to. Um, so yeah, the legal ops team are kind of going in and being like, well, actually, do you want some help drafting company documents? Um, another really example, actually, a good example of that is um, like team expenses. Mm. Um, people, I don't know if your business uses clear cards, but now like it's so popular to use these prepaid cards, but you have to go and set out an expenses policy hand in hand. Mm. Um, otherwise, you know, if someone starts buying first class train tickets everywhere, and these are actual examples I've seen. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, again, it's that growth point. I think once you hit a certain size of business, you get people who aren't so invest in the business. Wow. They're just, it's a job. So they're a bit more willing to like be a bit for like spend a lot more money of the business's money to go for nice dinners, um, mm. get first class train tickets. And I've had them turn around then and be like, well, you don't have an expenses policy banning me from doing this. Like, uh, what's yeah, to stop yeah, me? Yeah, fair, fair. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, common sense. This is there's a story of Netflix. There's a podcast about them, and um, where they had a rule. They they said, as a manager, I will review your expenses, and if there's anything maybe that is not following the policy, I'll let you know. As the manager, like your manager, let's say, or you can choose not to be reviewed by the manager. But suddenly, the finance team can just take a look at their the finances. And if there's something that is not according to policy, yeah. they get fired immediately. Oh, wow. And, um, and that's basically how it works. So is you do, you use, you know, you start spending, blah, blah, blah. And then there's something maybe not, you know, rare as so there's no policy that covers it all. You as a manager will say, hey, look, this is okay and not okay. And then it's all good. Or you can choose not to take that path. And, and then, yeah, people would be automatically terminated, just out. Because there's um, a principle of trust, I don't remember, one of the values. Yeah. And it's trust. And if you're not trustworthy, then, then you're out. But this is just so fascinating how this expense management or so expense policies affect culture as well. When you need to have common sense, if you want to have something that covers, you know, how the team is operating. Mm. That's a very good point. Um, because actually the one other thing I'd add to next year is I'll be interested if we still do have this hangover where companies got lots of investments and uh, sometimes you look at the perks of these businesses and you know they're going off on a company ski trip every year and um, maybe they're paying for coffees for everyone every day yeah <laughs> and that actually very much comes from I guess Silicon Valley um, but yeah it, at the end of the day it does cost the business money. And my firm belief is, uh, maybe this comes from my personal viewpoint, but I want to work with startups. Like those benefits are not what I'm excited about. Yes, um, this is what we said before. Is yeah. They learn something great, we create people, we great resources and paying great money. 
Um, so I'll see. I'm interested to see if there's be any cultural shift in that. And maybe I'm particularly sensitive for the finance team who's always like, guys, why, why are you spending all this money on <laughs> like wine and uh, cheese? <laughs> well, Oliver, it was great to have you on the podcast. I'm loving your work and hopefully we can see you soon. Thank no, you so much. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.